Good afternoon from Stockholm and a very, very warm welcome to this year's Global Award for Entrepreneurship Research, one of the most prestigious awards in the world for entrepreneurship research, presented annually from here in the Swedish capital. My name is Maddie Savage. I'm a journalist and broadcaster, and I'll be hosting this event. A lot of my work focuses on innovation and entrepreneurship for global media, including the BBC. So I'm really happy to be here to present this year's award. As you can probably hear from my accent, I am from the UK, but I do live here in Stockholm, so I haven't broken any COVID travel restrictions to be here. But speaking of the pandemic, of course, we are doing things a little bit differently with this digital event, but we hope uh, that those of you watching from home or from the office or wherever you are will still get a lot out of this event. You'll have a chance to hear um, from this year's winner and a little bit of discussion about his work as well. But before we move on to that, here's a bit of background to this year's award. For more than 25 years, Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum has been committed to providing high quality and policy relevant research. My name is Johan Eklund, I'm the Managing Director and Professor of Economics. Behind me on the wall here, you see examples of our activities. These are articles in the main newspapers in Sweden and they represent our vision to provide high quality research in a package and format that is available to policymakers as well as the business community. Our focus area is entrepreneurship, innovation, growth and renewal of the Swedish economy in a broad sense. I am proud to say that today Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum is the leading network organization of its kind in Sweden. Our mission can be summarized in three keywords. Number one is research. We conduct, initiate and communicate policy relevant research. Second is network. We connect researchers based in Sweden with the international research community, but we also connect policymakers, politicians, business community with academia. Number three is debate. We serve as a bridge between theory and practice in the public debate. There is today a broad consensus on the role and importance of entrepreneurship for economic development. The attitudes toward entrepreneurship has changed during the last couple of decades. However, our work is not done. Conditions for entrepreneurs as well as the role of entrepreneurship in our economy needs a continuous attention. In order to remain competitive, we need to have an informed policy discussion. Our contribution is to each year publish around 20 policy reports and organize about 30 public events. We also partner up with international organizations and organize events to discuss current economic and political developments. We believe that high quality research an informed policy debate is not only critical for policy making but ultimately also for our ability to remain competitive and maintain our prosperity. In order to encourage research on entrepreneurship, we give out the Global Award for Entrepreneurship Research. The award was established in 1996 and is today the foremost award of its kind globally. The Global Award consists of this bronze statue called the Hand of God and 100,000 euros. The award is given to scholars who have enhanced our theoretical or empirical understanding of entrepreneurship and the role of entrepreneurship in economic renewal and economic development. All right, well, thanks very much to Johan Eklund, uh, who joins us uh, here now in Stockholm. We have two other guests with us for this next section. Uh, Lars Baxel, the founder of Resi Farm and one of the major donors to this year's award, and also Frederick Herholm, a professor and managing director of IFN, which is the Research Institute of Industrial Economics, also based here in Stockholm. Uh, so, uh, Johan, uh, let's begin with you. You've, you've told us a little bit about why you give out this award each year, but why is it so important? It We've been actually giving out this for more than 25 years and by today we've given out 
uh, or awarded 29 scholars. And uh, the reason we do this is we really want to encourage entrepreneurship research. Uh, and we take it, uh, I must emphasize that we, we take it very seriously. So we put a lot of effort into uh, serious evaluation. I should also mention we, uh, when we established this prize, we did it in joint uh, with IFN, who is the co-founder of the, the award. And today we've awarded a number of very uh, well-known scholars. I can mention Israel Kirsner, William Baumol, Sidney Winter, uh, Philippe Aguillon, Arnando de Soto, and today we're giving the award to John Haltivanger. Yes, that's been uh, public for a little while, uh, but let's hear more about him uh, from Frederick. Well, I think if you listen to the, the, the purpose of this award and the aim of this award, I think everyone sees that Jon Haltwanger is, is a perfect match. Uh, he's one of these researchers who has done a tremendous amount of work on, on many different issues, but issues related to, to entrepreneurship. I actually, before this, I took, uh, took the opportunity to go through his, his CV and see what he has done. And you can see he's been doing on work on, on important work on so many different issues. So in the 80s, he started by looking at uh, what happens when there are uncertainties in markets or when actors have different information or when uh, there is not fully rational actors. Uh, but then as time passed, he came more and more into this work on, on firms and on entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and the effects of, of that. And, and, and uh, I think also this is a time where he, he develops this really interesting work where he links microeconomic economics or you know, how firms behave, where he links that to uh, macroeconomic outcomes, uh, for instance, in terms of employment or, or unemployment. And it's also, I think, in, in the late 80s or the 90s, he develops this really, I would call it a unique touch. I mean, you can really see when it's a Haltivanger paper, uh, firstly, by it's always interesting, important issues. So it doesn't waste time on things that are of uh, marginal interest to society. And then he's so careful in the, in the data work. So he collects the appropriate data for the issue at hand. And he's a genius when it comes to tell a very interesting and, and a convincing story based on sometimes, if I may say so, rather simple descriptive statistics or, or econometrics. And that's a unique talent. Mm. And then, of course, for this prize, uh, there are maybe some, some of his work that's worth highlighting more than others. And I would in particular like to emphasize the work on uh, uh, how entrepreneurs and firms uh, shape uh, employment and, uh, and productivity. So a lot of his work is uh, he uses concepts and discusses uh, issues such as uh, job creation and job destruction. And some of his findings is very important. For instance, uh, he finds that large firms are actually very important in, in job creation, and, and in particular in what can be called maybe uh, high-quality jobs. Mm. And then he, in, in the productivity work, he, he looks at... We often think of productivity as something that happens in the firm, right? But aggregate productivity also depends on if you have strong firms coming into the market or weak firms leaving the market mm. or good firms capturing a larger market share. So he looks at all of these dynamics and, and also result in, in some really interesting findings. Great. So some really interesting and, and tangible research. I'm looking forward to hearing his uh, lecture coming up uh, in just a short while. Uh, but next we'll, we'll hear from Lars, uh, one of the major donors uh, to the award. Why is it so important for you to contribute and, and what do you make of this year's winner? Well, uh, to start off, I, I, I will say that I feel privileged to, to be the donor. And, and the thing is that if you look at what we in the industry, in the business world, can contribute with, it's not only money, but I think also the support showing that this is important. Mm. The, the, the mere fact that this is an area where you see a lot of growth, not only startup companies, etc., but also from an employment point of view, mm. that's where we see people will be employed in the future makes a lot of sense for us to show that we would like to support this. Uh, I, I think that when I, when I look back a little bit on my own career, I graduated from the Stockholm School of Economics in 78. There were two of us who went into entrepreneurship. Mm. Both founded companies, both went to the stock exchange later. Uh, when I look upon my daughters, who just recently have graduated from the Stockholm School of Economics, their peers, they're, they're, they're all the others, they only talk about 
entrepreneurship. Mm. Something has happened over these years. And I would like to say that that is highly contributed by, by the fact that we have research and people who stand up and, and speak about this area. It's not just a bus phrase or something that you like to do whenever you have some time over, but there is a solid, solid academic research here which also proves that there is a, for, a way forward for this. Mm. So yes, I, I, I once again, I picked up the pool. I'm not the only one who has been here for over the years contributing to this. But I think it's very important that we do it. And I'm, as I said, I feel genuinely privileged to be that person. Fantastic. And I think this is an example of Stockholm has a reputation globally as having a very solid ecosystem for entrepreneurs, helping one another and learning mm. from one another, as well as uh, the ec academic research as well. Uh, so thanks very much to uh, all of you. We're going to get a little bit more uh, global reaction uh, now to this year's uh, winner. And hopefully we can connect up uh, live now with Marianne Feldman. She's a professor at the University of North Carolina, a previous winner of the Global Award for Entrepreneurship Research. I hope that you are there and can hear us, Marianne. Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, so just tell us uh, your thoughts, please, on uh, John Haltwanger. Very good. And so I'm an avid consumer of John Haltwanger's research. And I'm so pleased and, and honored that he is now joining this group of recipients. I think it's especially um, important because David Birch first received this award 25 years ago in 1996. And Birch made an important contribution in pointing out that small firms were responsible for the majority of growth in the U.S. economy. And through John Haltwanger's work, we now realize that it's not small firms, it is young firms who just happen to start out small and who are really creating the disproportionate number of jobs. John's work is empirically superb, and he has demonstrated um, a lot about our trends in entrepreneurship, really documenting the slowdown in the U.S. in new firm formation. And I think it's really important to recognize that through John's work, he has created um, a really important research tool that is firm level longitudinal data that allows researchers to explore the dynamics of job creation and economic performance. This is joint work with John Abound and Julia Lane, but it is from the basis of this important research tool that we're seeing a lot of empirical advancements in the study of entrepreneurship. Thank you and congratulations, John. Thanks very much, Marianne. Really great to get your input uh, and hear uh, on some of those elements of his research that you found most interesting. We've got another reaction uh, coming from here in Stockholm, but also remotely. It is uh, from Jan Olof Jacke. He is the CEO of the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. Dear Professor Holtewinger, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise believes that research on entrepreneurship is critical for us to better understand how our entrepreneurs and our companies can contribute to increased prosperity and to a green transformation. Through such knowledge, the organization I represent becomes much better at our core mission, which is to work for better conditions for companies and businesses operating in Sweden. A well-functioning structural transformation and the ability to move resources from shrinking to expanding companies is crucial if the transformation towards a green and digital future is going to be successful. But not only from shrinking to, uh, to expanding, but also from low productivity companies and sectors to high productivity companies and sectors. In that, the flexible labor market is an absolute key element. And for us now to really restart the economy after the pandemic, I believe firmly that your research plays an even greater importance than before. Our ability to quickly move resources from low productivity to high productivity, to move resources from decreasing to expanding companies is going to be a key success factor as we work our way through the pandemic crisis. 
To understand more of the processes, how jobs are created and how they disappear is central. We also know the importance of internationally comparable data. And thanks to your research, Professor Halterwinger, we are much more capable to take on the future and meet the, fu the future challenges. So let me say a big, big thank you and extend my heartfelt congratulations for receiving this award. Thank you. And there from Jan Olof Jacke from the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. Well, now I think we can go and speak to the man himself, uh, this year's award winner, uh, joining us via a live link uh, from Maryland. Uh, John Heltewenger, can we see you and hear you? Yes, wonderful. Uh, great to have you beaming into us here in Stockholm and to everyone else's homes and offices that are watching uh, around the world. Congratulations on receiving the award. I know you've known about this from some time, but how does it feel to, to receive this very prestigious honour within your field? It, it, it is truly a great honour. Um, as, as, uh, as has been uh, said earlier, there's, there's a long list of very very distinguished recipients. And so uh, it's a great honor to be included in that, in that long list. Can I say I, I feel fortunate that I, I know virtually all of them, or in some capacity or another, certainly of their work, but also have, have met them and, and, uh, and followed their research and their contributions. So it's a great honor to be included. It, you know, I, I want to very much thank the organizations that have created uh, this award. And, and, and uh, I agree with, with, with their mission completely in terms of uh, trying to promote uh, then kind of the need for, for the understanding of entrepreneurs, uh, in, in the economy. Uh, I think when they started this award back in the 1990s, entrepreneurship was, was maybe not on the, on the front pages of, of, uh, of research. Um, uh, but, but it has become so, and it, and it's awards like this that, uh, that have made that, uh, um, uh, true. Fantastic. Well, we're looking forward to hearing from you shortly, John. So it's time for the rest of us to sit back. We've got a lecture coming up uh, for around the next 30 minutes or so to find out a little bit more about this year's winner's research. Enjoy. So can you see my screen, I hope? Yes, it looks like you can. So um, again, it's a, gr it's a great honor to uh, both get this award and, and, and to be able to give this lecture. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's a, hardly a modest title, uh, Entrepreneurship in the 21st Century. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it my best shot in terms of, uh, in terms of my thoughts about what, what is going on. It's, it's a topic that I've been actively engaged in, as, uh, as you'll see as I go through uh, my remarks. Um, I have I, I, I have a very long list of collaborators. I've actually been working on this topic um, broadly defined uh, since uh, the mid 1980s. I, I, and actually, I, I should mention at least one of my collaborators, Stephen Davis from the University of Chicago. He was one of my earliest collaborators, where we started our early work on measuring and analyzing job creation and destruction uh, back in 1987, uh, and starting to work with the U.S. Census Bureau at that time. But it's a very long list of collaborators, and I. There, there is a, a prize article where I, I cite and, and discuss that work at, at length. I won't have lots of citations in this talk, but I, uh, I, I wouldn't be here today with, without all that uh, collaborative work. So, so what am I about today is, as has already been discussed in kind of the opening remarks is about, you know, why, why this award is important, uh, is, is the evidence is that, that entrepreneurs are really critical for uh, the success of the economy. Uh, the work that I have done, but but also uh, lots of others show that employer startups in particular contribute disproportionately to job creation, innovation, and productivity growth. And I think what's interesting and important about entrepreneurs is they are they, they inherently are induce innovation, but they're also drawn to innovation. So when we see a sector uh, taking off, uh, that that draws in entrepreneurs. And, and, a, and a critical role of entrepreneurs in innovation is their experimentation. So you often you often see kind of a noisy process where lots of lots of entry, um, lots of dispersion in outcomes, uh, including productivity, but also that in turn uh, lots of dispersion with, uh, with with many of those entrants failing. But out of 
out of a cohort of entrants that's entered in in response to and in creating innovation, uh, we, we see we see enormous gains to the to the U.S. economy, to the U.S. and, and the world economy. Now, I, I should note that this this talk, as I go through the details, is going to be very U.S. centric. Although, you know, increasingly, uh, organizations like the OECD ha ha have been able to document that the kind of findings I'm going to I'm going to talk about today um, actually hold. Uh, uh, pretty generally in, in the, uh, in, particularly in the OECD economies. So the, so the theme today is going to be the 21st century. And, and, and what have we seen uh, in the 21st century? Well, if I, if, if I was giving this talk um, pre-pandemic, um, mostly I'd be talking about the concerns, which I, I think are, are still out there, that there has been a decline, not only in the United States, but particularly in the United States, in the share of activity accounted for by young firms. There's been a decline in the startup rate, um, and there's been a decline in, in, in uh, and I'll show you, you know, the share of employment and, and other kinds of measures in young firms. And, and the flip side of that, uh, almost by construction, is we've seen increased concentration of activity in large, mature, sometimes in the recent uh, research literature called superstar firms. And and, 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 and lots of us have been trying to figure out, well, what's going on? What, what, what has happened um, to the U.S. and the world economy that we're, we, we've become, I'll say, less entrepreneurial? Uh, uh, you'll, you'll see in just a few minutes, my last slide is, it's not as though entrepreneurship has gone away. It's still, an, 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 I'll say, an amazing contributor to job creation, innovation, and productivity growth. But there's been a downward trend, and, so, and, and, and a large enough one that it's worth paying attention to. Now, some have argued, my, myself included, that there are, at least in some sectors, potentially benign factors that uh, under, underlie some of these. And, and probably the sector where that holds the most true is retail trade. So retail trade has seen a shift over the last few decades away from what we often call in the United States mom and pop stores, single unit establishment firms, just one location, towards establishments that belong to large national and global national firms. And uh, it, it's pretty clear that's been driven by globalization and information technology. Retail trade is all about distribution, and globalization and information technology have been especially advantageous to these large national chains, particularly the ones that have been able to take advantage of those changes to establish very efficient uh, distribution networks. And, and, and we've shown that particularly in retail trade, this transformation has, has been productivity enhancing. So, that, so this is it's actually been part of the creative destruction process, and in this case, a shift away from young, uh, small firms to, to, to large, mature firms. But, but that kind of story doesn't hold well across all sectors of the economy. The, it, there's lots of evidence, literally over most of the 20th century, that many innovations come along and entrants play a critical role. And, and, and a good example of that is what we think of as the high-tech sectors of the world economy in the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And here I'm thinking of mostly, you know, about the sectors, and indeed in, in, the, in the article, uh, make it very clear. This is, think about this as the information communication technology sector plus biotech, basically the, the high STEM intensive sectors of the economy. And, and in the 1990s, actually leading, before, before there was a productivity surge, there was a surge in entry. And, and then, in, and, and then, in, and productivity surged dramatically um, in, in these sectors. And, and in the post 2000 period, we've seen a decline in young firm activity, an increase in literally superstar firms in the high tech sector. But during this period of time, uh, we've seen a decline in aggregate productivity growth and driven by a decline in uh, uh, productivity growth in the high tech sector. So uh, it, it's hard to look at that evidence and think that that's completely benign. And then there, and I'll talk briefly, there, there's a, accompanying evidence that suggests that, that the economy is, is, um, it, uh, it is not doing as much productivity enhancing uh, reallocation. That came up earlier in kind of the remarks about uh, how economies advance. There's been a decline in what we call business dynamism, the pace of reallocation of resources from less productive to more productive uh, businesses. There's evidence of increasing uh, markups, and there's actually evidence uh, kind of going very much along this with this shift in the size distribution to, towards increased uh, market concentration. 
So I'm not giving this talk in 2019. Um, I'm giving this talk in, uh, in, in 2021. And I, and, and, um, I should have stated at the outset, I'm sorry, I'm not physically there. I mean, we, we all have, and this is related a bit to where my, my next remarks is the, is we've, we've had to accommodate, uh, changes in, in our, our, certainly our daily lives and the way we work, the way we consume. And this is showing up in the entrepreneurship data. So there has been an, uh, an amazing and surprising surge in applications for new businesses in the United States in the pandemic. Not right at the beginning, not the first two months, but since June of last year, the applications for new business in the United States are at historical highs. So it looks like potentially there's a reversal of trend or if nothing else, an amazing surge that, and, and, so, and, and again, earlier remarks already kind of hinted at this. Uh, it looks as though as in, in terms of the restructuring that is needed, um, both during the pandemic, but, but post pandemic, that entrepreneurs will play a critical role. And so I'll, I'll try to provide some, some evidence on, on, uh, on both of these. Uh, and, and in turn, I will, um, uh, try to try to give some interpretation as to what I think is going on uh, for entrepreneurship in the 20th, 21st century. So I'm going to go through some of the basic facts pretty quickly. Uh, I won't I won't describe all the details of all of, of all the figures. Uh, the, the, uh, I'll hope the the slides will, will be made uh, broadly available for those who who, who want to see and understand the details. So one of the things that my research has 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 shown is that. Uh, young firms are really critical for job creation, but it, in a very complex and noisy fashion. So in the left panel, what you're seeing is the job destruction from exiting firms, basically an employment-weighted exit rate. And you can see who, what businesses are the most likely to exit, the youngest firms. Indeed, after the first five years, about 50% of the jobs for any given cohort that's come in are already gone because of exit. But, but, but look, go look at the red bars as well in the left panel, and you can see that young firms uh, have the highest net growth rates, conditional on survival. And, and underlying that, if we go to the right panel, is it, it's misleading to say, oh, look, you know, if you survive, you're going to grow fast. Indeed, the median young firm, if you look at that at the middle bar, doesn't grow. But the high mean is being driven by high skewness. So what's true about young firms is enormous dispersion in, um, in outcomes but also enormous skewness. And by skewness, I mean that the highest growth firms, look at the 90th percentile, the 90th percentile, that's at the top, those green bars, the, those are much larger in magnitude than the 10th percentile in, in absolute magnitude. And so there's a relatively small fraction of, of young firms that grow very rapidly. And when we integrate this data, which I've done, it's not showing on the slide here, with the data on innovation and productivity growth, uh, they go hand in hand. It's the high growth uh, firms that are playing an especially big role, not only in job creation, but also innovation and productivity growth. What, one of the things that's also striking about this skewness in the growth rate distribution is it's especially apparent in sectors undergoing rapid innovation. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, so entrepreneurs play this critical role, but in this very noisy, complex uh, process. Closely related, and I hinted at this earlier, we've done, uh, we, we studied the high tech sector in particular at the detailed industry level. And the reason we did this is we wanted to kind of, you know, provide a characterization of, of the role of entrance in the productivity growth process that we saw. And, and in many ways, what we found is that the entrance into a, into these innovative sectors is like a canary in the mind. It's a signal that, that, important things are about to happen. And, and, and I think we need to be careful when thinking about that is, is, is I think it's, it's both entrepreneurs being drawn to the innovative sectors, but also inducing the innovation. I think it's, it's interesting that probably the causality goes both ways. In any event, what, what I'm showing you here is over, over a, a relatively long period of time, what we see is if you see a surge in entry of, in some detail in the sector, actually the first thing that happens in the subsequent three years is not productivity growth. Actually, you see productivity decline. But you see lots of dispersion in, 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 in productivity across the firms, in the, consistent with this notion of, a, of experimentation. 
But then when we go in the out years, you know, seven to nine years later, that's when the productivity uh, growth kicks in and actually the dispersion uh, declines. And, w- and what we do see not shown here is, is associated with this is a shakeout process where there was enormous entrance, lots of experimentation. The successful entrants grew, grow rapidly and the less successful entrants contract and exit. And that's what underlies both the decline in dispersion and the increase in, in productivity growth. So, so when you look particularly at the high tech sectors that, that play such a big role uh, in, the, in the 1990s, early 2000s, it's clear entrants um, uh, were, were an important part of the story. Uh, closely related research, the very nice, some nice work by Daron Asimoglu and many co-authors, is that, you know, they've linked in the innovation data, the patent data, the R&D data, and the like, particularly in these innovative intensive sectors, and found consistent with the with the um, mechanisms that I'm talking about, that uh, the, the small young firms are, are, are in these in innovative intensive sectors are the most innovative intensive. So now, now let's go to the 21st century. So I, I, I've already uh, hinted at this, but you can see in these two panels on the left, I'm showing you the share of employment at young firms. I'm using up to age 10. That's not critical. I could use up to age five or even just the startup rate, we'd see similar patterns. Um, but but, I, but, I, but what, what I want you to see is, is, is this decline. Actually, the decline precedes the, the 2000 period, but, but, but notice, uh, so I'll say, dramatically different patterns across sectors. So while the overall economy has an overall decline, that's largely being driven by sectors like retail trade, where we already talked about the kind of structural transformation that was undergoing in, in retail trade. Whereas look at the high-tech sector, and again, the high-tech sectors are the are the ICT plus biotech sector, it's saw an enormous surge in young firm activity uh, and, then, and then a decline. And a, and a significant enough decline, it wasn't just that there was a, a bubble, where, you know, by, by 2018, where, where this figure goes to, we're substantially below where we were back in the 1980s. Certainly we're way below where we were in the, in, in the late 1990s. The flip side of this picture is, the, is, is what you're seeing in terms of the share of activity at more mature firms. And you can see it literally is the mirror image. And so we've seen this shift Again, away from young firms towards uh, more mature firms. Now, uh, it's useful to, to look at not only age, but size. They're, they are closely connected. And so uh, here I'm showing us the share of employment at truly mega firms, what we might call the superstar firms, the 10,000 plus uh, size firms, and for selected four-digit industries. And, it, and it's important here to break down the industries into quite detailed levels to kind of get the story right. And that's particularly true in the high tech sector. So in the high tech sector, there is the, you might call it old high tech, which is in manufacturing, computers, communication equipment, semiconductors, not shown here, but related. What have we seen in, in the high tech sectors in manufacturing? Actually, we've seen a decline in the share of mega firms in terms of their, their accounting for activity. What, but that's actually just sort of a pervasive part of manufacturing shrinking in terms of its share of activity. And so manufacturing is both getting, you could say, somewhat unusually both older and, and, and actually smaller. Whereas in, in, the, in the sectors that really took off in the late 1990s and, 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 and so on, it's, we've seen this, if you look at the lower left panel, the high-tech non-manufacturing, we've seen this big surge in the and the high tech sectors in, in, in places like information services, software publishers, computer systems design. And, and these are precisely the sectors by where uh, the key, you could say, big tech firms uh, are, are playing just a, an outside role. You can also see in the upper right hand panel, we see this, this, you know, uh, this longer run trend, this transformation going on in the, in the retail trade sector. And again, I've argued that at least some parts of that may be benign. Um, uh, although we, we, we could, we, when we begin looking at things like markups and other kinds of things, uh, there may be some downsides, of course, to this structural transformation uh, as well. So um, I, I, I've just quickly uh, gone through what's happened to uh, young and uh, a small versus you know, large mature firms in the U.S. economy. And, uh, and again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area of very active research to try to understand these this, this uh, this enormous structural transformation going on uh, in the U.S. and the world economy. 
But I, I, I always come back uh, to, to the basic evidence on productivity for, the, for those who uh, advocate and argue, uh, and we'll talk about it in a second, well, you know, how much of this is benign. And I'm just like, well, maybe, maybe some parts are benign, but, but, it's, but it's hard to argue with the productivity data. And, and, and what we know is there was a surge in productivity. I'm showing you TFP on the left panel, and then I'm showing you output per hour on the right panel. And uh, it's particularly the right panel I want you to pay attention to. What, what, what's useful and interesting with the right panel is uh, it's clear that the surge in productivity in the 1990s and early 2000s was driven by the high tech sector. And then the decline in productivity in the, since the mid 2000s has actually been driven by the high tech sector. So, so look, you know, look in the most recent years, there's just been anemic overall aggregate productivity growth and the high tech sector in many ways has led the way. Uh, so for those who are saying, well, no, wait a second, these large uh, mature mega firms are, that's where all the innovation's going on. Uh, maybe, uh, as we'll talk about in just a second, but, but, but it's certainly not showing up at least yet in the productivity statistics. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. So, I've largely covered uh, some aspects of the causes and consequences and in, in telling you about this, but I, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, well, uh, you know, why we think uh, some aspects of this have, uh, have, have, are adverse. What are the possible mechanisms uh, underlying this? There's not widespread agreement, I'm going to say, on this, but, but, but you, in many ways what we're doing is we're trying to bring in additional facts to help us understand um, what might be going on. So one idea that, that Robert Gordon in particular has, has advocated is that innovation slowed down. And innovation draws in entrepreneurs, by the way. So um, you, you might have seen, there's great t uh, TED Talks between Robert Gordon and Eric Rudolson, who's like who is a you know, leading uh, specialist in technology and much more of a techno optimist than, than Bob. And, and if, if you read, uh, uh, Eric's uh, latest work over the last uh, few years, he, he, he's kind of acknowledged this productivity puzzle. And, he, and his view is, 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 is that in many ways we're, we're, we're going through another phase like Robert Solow described back in 1987. There's a famous quote from quote, Solow, which is, we see computers everywhere except in the, in the productivity statistics. Eric Wendelson would say, we see AI everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. And so, so where, where, where's Eric coming from on this? Eric's argued that the, what's often called the J-curve effects, which are, are that there's often a period of time where actually productivity slows down during periods of rapid innovation, uh, maybe especially long with things like AI and, and robotics and, and automation. I, I think that's a really interesting argument, but, but here's the big difference in, in, in relative to when Solo was talking about. Entry was starting to surge right around the time uh, in the high tech sectors, right around the time Solo was making those claims. Now, pre pandemic, we weren't seeing that. So, so if, if Eric's right, uh, something different is going on. Now, somewhat related to this is, uh, is there is increased evidence. Uh, I'm not showing you this here today, but I'm trying to give you some perspective about some of the topics that people are, are, are investigating here is, uh, that back in the 1990s, you, one would say you wanted to be the next Google. That was sort of the object, you know, obviously nobody, even Google didn't know they were going to be Google, per, perhaps. Uh, but now if you're, it, it's not that you want to be the next Google, you want to be acquired by Google. And, and the question, by the way, there, there is increased evidence that that's actually what's going on in the data. So why aren't we seeing, why are we seeing uh, this declining share of activity of young firms? They're getting bought up relatively early on uh, in, 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 their, um, in their startup process. And, and again, you, you could tell benign uh, uh, versions of that uh, of that mechanism. But 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 again, I'll say again, we don't fully understand it. But but one could push back in a couple of ways. One is there's some very nice research that suggests large mature firms actually have an incentive to to do defensive innovations to protect their market share. And and one way of, one way that's complementary with that is actually to, to buy up the competition. And then the second thing is, if this again, this comes back again to what I'd said earlier, if, if this was nothing but benign, then why are the productivity statistics so low? So an another key factor that many people were investigating that I think actually is potentially quite important is the aging of the population. 
So that this is true in the United States. It's certainly true in Western Europe. It's true in Japan. And and uh, in, in a, a, a cost of, a, of an older population is it's less dynamic, it's less mobile, less willing to reallocate uh, from, from less productive to, to, to more productive uh, businesses. The um, there's been some very nice work recently that you know that, that that pushes back against the idea that the that the the high growth startups are all coming from you know 20 to 30 year olds. That's that, that, that the evidence is against that. It's actually more uh, in, in the 40 to 50 range, but it's not in the 55 plus range, and that's sort of the problem, right? That we're getting the the share of the population in in 55 plus is growing, and so there there are businesses start up by 55 plus year olds, but they tend not to be these highly dynamic growth firms that I've been talking about. And then there's the accompanying evidence, which I'll give you some very brief evidence on uh, in just a second, of rising markups and, and declining dynamism. So let me, let me, let me go, go to that evidence. So on the left, I'm using data that's, that, that's uh, from the same sources that I was showing you the age and the size distribution. And here I'm showing you the pace of job reallocation. It's the sum of job creation and destruction. And it's been shown to be a, a useful summary measure um, of the extent of productivity enhancing uh, reallocation. You have to be careful about that because, you know, dynamism for dynamism's sake isn't, isn't uh, good, but, uh, but actually the evidence has been quite strong is that, uh, that, that the reallocation that we see in the data is actually moving resources from less productive to more productive uh, uses. And when you see a decline, you ought to be potentially concerned, at least ask, okay, is, this, uh, it, 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 is something adverse going on? Again, you kind of see the same pattern we saw before. You see a sort of a long run decline overall in the economy, but again, that's mostly being led by sectors like retail trade. And in retail trade, the shift away from mom and pops towards large businesses has led to a decline in the pace of reallocation. And, and instead of it being productivity detracting, it's actually been productivity enhancing because, because the, the large businesses have such a productivity advantage. But that's not so true in the high tech sector. And again, so you can see just like the, you know, this mimics uh, exactly what we saw in terms of the changing age and size dynamics. We saw that uh, reallocation was actually rising um, over, over, um, from the late 70s uh, to the early 2000s and then it has been falling pretty significantly. Another piece of evidence uh, is from, from actually great work that was just published in the last year by uh, Jan DeLoker and co-authors. I'm showing you a, a figure from their work and it's showing you the distribution of markups in the United States. Um, across all kinds of firms, although it's, it's publicly traded firms. And the thing I want you to, to emphasize is the, is the 90th percentile. So what they found is that the average markup's been going on. This is revenue-weighted markups. But that's been particularly been driven by a, a change in the right tail, particularly the high markup firms. And who are these markup firms? They also show in other work uh, that's been done recently about superstar, superstar firms is these, these are literally the superstar firms. So it's the biggest firms charging... Uh, the largest markups. So, so I give you this evidence that at least raises questions about whether this is all benign because in, indeed uh, we're seeing a, a declining dynamism and, and rising markups. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring this to a close by, by saying, well, well, wait a second, maybe things are turning around. Uh, I, I'm going to say at the outset, uh, uh, obviously the pandemic has had enormous adverse consequences on, on many different dimensions of life health and morbidity, the tremendous slowdown in economic activity, especially, it's been a very uneven, it's had especially uh, difficult uh, effects on, on low-skilled workers who were uh, needed to, could not work remotely. And so that, that, that's a group that's been hit really hard. Uh, it, it, it had disproportionate effect on women with children at home. Um, e e e even if it's not impacting employment, it's certainly impacting their allocation of time uh, in, in just dramatic ways in terms of being able to manage uh, kids at home at the same time of, of potentially trying to work. So I, I, I don't want to say in spite of this, but I think actually it's, it's quite striking in this, in this, this truly devastating time that entrepreneurs are, are on the rise. And so I'm going to show you some evidence that there's just dramatic changes in the pace of new business applications. This is a new series that I and others have helped create uh, from, from census. What's great about this data is it's, uh, it's very high frequency. It's actually weekly and monthly, and it's almost real time. So, so I'm, I'm showing you data I'll be showing you through April 2021 and through actually early May 2021. Uh, every Thursday 
some, some new data are released for the previous week. So I'll show you briefly what's happened. So I'm showing you, I'm splitting up your, the, the, the overall series is new business applications. And what are these business applications? These are applications for what's called in the, in the United States a taxpayer ID, an employer identification number. And, and why is this informative? I'll, I'll make the case that it's highly informative. It's particularly for employer businesses. You have to have an employer identification number if you're going to start up a business because you, you have to pay payroll taxes. And so that's the blue series. And you can see the, that we went into the Great Recession, new applications fell, and in many ways never recovered. And I'm going to show you just in a second that blue series tracks actual startups incredibly well. Now, there's also another part of the economy that I'm, I'm spending less time on. I'm happy to chat about it in questions if we'd like. There, there are also lots of, there's a key part of entrepreneurship, which is the non-employers, basically the self-employed business owners who, who, who don't hire workers. That's actually a much bigger part of the business dynamics. They don't, they don't create a lot of jobs by construction, but, but they have become increasingly important, particularly as you could say the gig economy um, has risen. And you can see that's the red part of the series. You can see it's, it, it, it's been actually had an upward trend pre-pandemic, unlike uh, employer businesses, and then has just has, has, has turned dramatically uh, larger in, uh, in the pandemic. So I'm going to dig into this real quickly um, so, so you have some sense about what, you know, what's going on. Do, is this real? So first I wanted to convince you, you might say, well, I don't know what to make of these new applications. Well, the good news is, at the Census Bureau, the, exactly the same data that I was showing you before about the new employer startups is, is completely linkable at the micro level to these applications. So we can actually literally say for every application that comes in, okay, <laughs> did, did, did a new firm emerge? And actually the transition rate's less than 50%. That's not obvious from this figure because I've used index numbers. But the key is that fluctuations in these, in these applications closely track, very closely track, the new employer startups as well. You can see it was, you know, as we moved into the Great Recession, uh, uh, both, both uh, applications and new employers fell, and then we've seen um, uh, uh, this dramatic surge. You, mu you might wonder, well, wait a second, how do I know what, what new employer startups are in April 2021? The answer is I don't. So this is actually projected through 2018, the, uh, the red line is actual, and then we use the, we, we have a projection model. The projection models worked very well in the past. If we take it seriously, uh, we're projecting an enormous number of, of startups. Now, I, I want to emphasize, by the way, that, that part of this uh, dynamic uh, process, I've already talked about the fact that when startups come in, many of them fail, many of them don't grow, but actually even the, the nascent entrepreneurship process is a complicated one. It, it, it often takes four to eight quarters after you apply for the EIN to hire your first worker. So in many ways, we're still waiting in the data to kind of see how much this surge that you're seeing is going to show up in the data. Now, I want to emphasize quickly that uh, uh, the, the pattern here in, in the pandemic is, is night and day relative to the Great Recession. And I'll make this point quickly, and, I'll, and I'm going to focus, given uh, time, I'm going to focus on uh, the likely employers, which is sort of the, 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 the group that I'm um, um, uh, mostly interested in here today. So you can see in the, what I've done is an event study, and the event in, in back in the Great Recession was the week that Lehman Brothers collapsed. And I'm showing you that basically the, the, as we move away from Lehman Brothers into the future, relative to a base period in 2006, I'm showing you that applications declined. And you can already see that in the basic statistics before. Where in the right panel, I'm showing you the same thing where the reference week is March 13, ending March 13, 2020. I think almost all of us remember exactly where we were that weekend, because that's weekend kind of the world shut down. And, and, then I'm, and then I'm showing you as we moved out from there, and then I'm showing you relative to a base period in, in, in 2020, I mean, excuse me, 2018. And you can see uh, an enormous surge uh, in applications. Now, uh, we, we know more than just these are, these are applications we actually know what sectors they're in. And what's striking about them is uh, they are concentrated exactly where you would expect if the new entrepreneurs are trying to move into uh, activities uh, that promote remote uh, interaction between uh, uh, businesses and consumers and, and actually businesses and its workers. And so 
uh, you could say the leading example, that is a 33% of the surge uh, it is an increase uh, in e-commerce. So I, I'm almost done. Uh, so, so let me try to bring this home. Uh, I've given you a whole bunch of facts, and let me take, just take a couple of minutes to, to provide some perspective um, on, on what I've, I've talked about. First, let's just talk a little bit about what, what's so different about, uh, about the COVID recession uh, relative to the Great Recession. I think there's at least two things that are different. And I think, and again, this is, we're very much still trying to figure this out. We were, all of us who put this data together were surprised or have been surprised at this enormous surge in entrepreneurship over this period. One thing that's very different from the Great Recession is that financial markets collapsed in the Great Recession. And, and, that, and, the, and the collapse of those financial markets was especially hard on young businesses. Young businesses hit very hard. Financial markets have remained pretty robust. Uh, in the COVID-19 uh, recession. I think the second thing is, I don't think that's sufficient for explaining the difference, because again, the, the, it's not just that the numbers didn't fall, they've risen so dramatically. And, and I think COVID-19 has provided incentives for the cha changing structure of business and work. Um, there's lots of evidence that the existing small businesses have been hit really hard but but in, in in some respects though what's happening is new businesses are are coming in uh in, in order to enable the economy to both adjust to the pandemic itself but also the post pandemic i think a huge big question of course is is how permanent the shift is uh to online mediated transactions i mean uh hopefully next year or later this year when you do the the the, the next order where everybody's in person but but i think there's lots of speculation that even though remote work won't stay at the level it is now, it will, it will be much higher than pre-pandemic. Uh, and we, we, you know, it was already the case that e-commerce was surging pre-pandemic. And, and uh, I, I think it's increasingly clear that, 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 that what, what the pandemic did was accelerate uh, um, pre-pandemic trends. That doesn't mean bricks and mortar is going away. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, I, I think there's, there's fundamental structural change going on. And so, uh, so, so, and again, I say the evidence is quite strikingly that young businesses, new businesses, are going to play a critical role in this restructuring. How long will it take for us to know? <laughs> and, and basically, the answer is that it will take some time. And so one of the things that's true about the, the work I have done, but also many, many others have done, people like Gordon Klepper or Boyan Yovanovic and so on, is... Uh, we really don't know for an entering cohort how well they're going to do until oftentimes five, 10 years out because there's this, an, this big wave of entrants. Many of them fail. Many don't grow. A small fraction grow rapidly. And so it's going to take, take a while. I, I, I think it's hard, even though we, don't, we won't know for five plus years or so exactly the, the, the contribution here. Either way, it's clear that entrepreneurship is playing a critical role in this, in this period of important structural change. And then the, the, the last remark I want to uh, give, this is my last slide, is, um, you know, I conveyed that, that we, we were on this downward trend, which, and there's no doubt that we are, but, but I want to emphasize, you know, even pre-pandemic, just how important entrepreneurship remains. So, one simple way of putting this is in 2006, with, you know, really before much of this uh, decline, remember there was a sharp decline in the recession, Great Recession, we didn't recover, is in the United States, there were roughly 570,000 new businesses, employer businesses, and they created 3.2 million new jobs. And that's a big number relative to the 3.7 million aggregate net job creation for the entire economy. So even with all this decline, in 2018, there were 430,000. Now, that's, that's substantially below that 570,000, and, and, but, but still created 2.4 million jobs, you know, relative to a 2.6 million aggregate net job creation. So it's hard to go away, even from a job creation perspective, saying that, that, uh, that entrepreneurs aren't disproportionately creating jobs. And by the way, notice that this new business formation statistics, this applications data, largely mimics the, the patterns I just told you. And then, then again, coming back to the pandemic, since uh, June of last year, we've had this, just this unprecedented uh, uh, a number of jobs for likely new uh, employers, and even more, by the way, for, uh, for likely uh, a, a new uh, non-employers. And so 
Um, it, it looks like, uh, again, entrepreneurs are going to be play a critical role for uh, the structural change that, that's ongoing right now. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Thank you so much uh, to John Helterwinger. Really interesting and fascinating data uh, analysis there of, of how we've got to where we are now and some uh, thoughts about the future coming off of the pandemic as well. So uh, really, really great to hear from you. And uh, you can stay with us as we bring back uh, two of our panellists uh, once again, uh, Johan Eklund and uh, Frederick Herholm, just to react really to, to some of the stuff you've said. And I think they've got a few questions for you as well. Um, Johan, uh, let's start with you. What, did you. what did you make of that presentation? Uh, let me begin by saying that, uh, you know, I started out my PhD reading papers by John, uh, so I'm quite excited <coughs> seeing these graphs and getting a presentation. Even though not, it's not live, I'm very excited. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions and maybe one or two comments, but uh, part of my work, uh, daily work, is to take research and repackage that in a way uh, that policymakers can access it and make sense uh, out of it. Uh, and you, uh, you make references to all these great economists like uh, Gordon and Hansen and others. And I don't think you explicitly uh, mentioned secular stagnation, but we, we have these mechanisms that competition is changing. Uh, it could be a competition that is explaining this downward trend. Uh, we could be facing headwinds in terms of uh, demographic developments. Uh, are we running out, like Gordon was saying, running out of ideas? Or, your words, benign factors such as uh, globalization? And my question is basically a very simple one. Uh, is it a problem? Is this downward trend a problem? And the reason I'm asking this is we as economists are preoccupied with this. But I've met, met uh, high-level politicians in Sweden and Europe who are basically ignoring this. We keep putting up, up slides showing this downward productivity trend, this downward trend in entrepreneurship, and the response is, oh, so what? Uh, we're a rich society. Why should we uh, be concerned? So is it the problem? And what can be policymakers uh, do about it. Uh, can I throw in another question uh, while I'm at it? As long as, uh, as long as John can remember, I have a feeling he can. <laughs> I, I have a feeling too. Uh, I, I have another question, which is more direct policy question. We, we are, uh, in the next week, we're publishing some results on entrepreneurship dynamics in the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. We've been working on, on that data, collected in second half of 2020. And we're observing quite a lot of the entrepreneurial dynamics that you're, you're mentioning. Uh, so my question is, has, and we see tremendous differences in terms of policy responses, how you have had support packages, how you've had social distancing, distancing, etc. Uh, and this we find patterns that this is actually correlated with both exit and entry and uh, this dynamics. So my question is, are uh, having an effective policy response in saving the, econ the economic consequences and the downturn, has that long, ru long run negative effects in restructuring our economies? Um, I have a few more, but... Uh, okay, I think let's, let's, uh, let's put those two to John. So first of all, how worrying is this downward trend? And secondly, what should policymakers uh, be doing about it? So oh, I, I think these are great questions, and, and we're, uh, I, I think we, and given the questions, we, we, we don't fully know the answers, but let me give you, um, give you my thoughts. So one is, I, I mean, I, I do think we care quite a bit about the slowdown in productivity growth. So if it were, if, if indeed there was this slowdown in the pace of reallocation, there was a slowdown in entrepreneurship, uh, if there was a shifting age and size distribution, but productivity was uh, robust and surging, uh, I, I think we wouldn't be so concerned, but but it, 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 productivity growth is slowing, and and you might say, well, wait, you know, why do we care about why do we care about that? Well, I actually think the evidence is quite overwhelming that differences across countries and differences within countries across time and welfare and GDP per capita are are related to productivity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also closely tied to wages, so productivity and wages go hand in hand. If there's a productivity slowdown, there's a wage slowdown. It's even a little more complicated than that because there's some evidence 
that the link, even though I just said they're tightly connected, that the link between productivity and wages has, has uh, become weaker over time. So that, so that, it, that um, both in terms of mean wage growth, but also um, uh, right, you know, more rising earnings inequality than there is in, in productivity dispersion. So, so I think the reason we care is, uh, I'd say, is productivity and, and wages. And, and we're still trying to understand um, all, all of that. Uh, having again said that, I think, I think there are some benign factors that, you know, that, that relate to the nature of globalization and information technology. And again, I think that you know, the retail trade sector uh, shows that. But, I, but now let's come to the pandemic. You could, what I find interesting is let, let, let's suppose we, we took the view that, that everything up through 2018 had been benign. Uh, here we've hit this, this, this really this devastating uh, blow to the to the world economy and and our daily lives, and and I, I you know again I think it's increasingly clear that the the way we go about our business even as even as the economies uh, population become vaccinated that we're going to work differently uh, in, in the future and and that's going to require restructuring uh, of the economy. And I, th I think the evidence is, interestingly, in, in this period of time where restructuring is needed, then entrepreneurship is going to play uh, uh, just a critical role. So that's sort of on the first topic, um, uh, uh, some thoughts. On the, on the second topic, I, I think one of, the, one of the big challenges for policy, Certainly, this has been true in the U.S., and I, I know a little bit less. I'd be, be very interested to hear about this in, in Sweden and, and, and in Western European economies. Is not surprisingly, much of the emphasis early on in the pandemic um, was to protect uh, U.S. jobs, and uh, and you cannot kind of understand that and protect you and, and uh, uh, the U.S. existing businesses. And so there was a this uh, this massive program, the payroll protection program, and, and and you can make a case for that in many ways. This, this was and, you know, this pandemic comes along, and through, you could say through no fault of their own, clearly, uh, businesses found themselves, um, you know, where, where, where basically business activity had, had plummeted, uh, to, in, particularly those that relied on in-person work and or in-person um, uh, consumption, uh, you know, just completely plummeted. And so it wasn't that hard to make the case uh, for that. But, but as the pandemic has continued, and, and this recognition that life is going to change in many ways that and this is a this is a tough call in many ways that support for existing small businesses has actually potentially been a damper on interest the simple economic theory says that if you actually support the incumbents uh then that's going to make it harder for entrants to come in and and, and compete so by the way so it's, in many ways it's it's, it's even that much more remarkable that apparently uh, entrepreneurs are coming in anyway uh, and, and, and at, 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 at in record high uh, levels. But, and, but my point on the policy is, is not to be critical of PPP. I understand the, 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 the important role that programs like PPP and other, um, other parts of the CARES Act in the United States and others have, have played. But, but a real big challenge, I think, in, in periods of time like this, maybe particularly when you need restructuring, is, well, what do you do to, to, to help facilitate entrepreneurship, right? Could, these are businesses that don't exist yet. And since they don't exist, uh, it's, it, it's hard to have policies uh, that facilitate this. People have various ideas on this, but this has been a longstanding challenge of, of it's often easier to have policies that assist the incumbents rather than the entrance. And I think that's a real challenge for for, for both policymakers and for those who are trying to understand entrepreneurship. Okay, I hope that answers your questions, uh, Yuan. Uh, I just want to ask you quickly, John, um, you, you, it's very refreshing to, for you to, to, to be here saying we don't actually have the data about what the world is going to look like because there's been so much speculation about how much we're going to be remote working and how much we're going to be uh, stopping business travel. Uh, what is your best guess and how do you think that feeds into the future of entrepreneurship? So, so I, you know, I, I think we have discovered, and we're doing it right now, right? We can discover, we can do a remarkable amount uh, remotely. And, um, and, and I, I think it, there's still great value in in-person. I actually think in forums like this, it would be much better if we were in person because indeed, uh, you know, some nature of interactions 
you know, this is great and the technology is working fantastic. Uh, you know, oftentimes I think at a research and an academic setting or, or, or in research forums like this, uh, the, the back and forth is, works that much better. I'm, 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 some of the folks here also teach like I teach, and I, I think teaching has been an enormous challenge in the, in the last year. I certainly have found that to be an enormous challenge, and I think my students uh, have as well. But having said that, I think, I think businesses have figured out, well, wait a second, we, we can be very productive uh, remotely. And so, so do I think business travel is going to return to where it was before? The answer is no, I don't think it is. Do I, I think a, a huge issue, for example, is downtown areas of big cities, right? So I think downtown areas of big cities, do you need as much office space there? Probably not. Commercial office, office space. Do you, need, do you need as much of the local uh, support industries, the retail trade, all, you know, all the coffee shops and the dry cleaners and the, and, and the other kinds of, and the restaurants for that matter, that are downtown that largely support the daytime population? I, you know, I, I think all of us will still want to go to restaurants. I think, I think actually restaurants will come back just fine in many ways, but, 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 but I'm, I'm less convinced they're going to do great if, they were, if, if, if it was the restaurants that were supporting uh, the daytime population. Everything I just said is completely speculative. Mm. But, but the, again, there's, there, there's lots of signs. You, you know, companies are announcing, even as they're coming back, they're announcing uh, very much hybrid kinds of plans. You're not going to be here five days a week. You're going to be here three days a week and, 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 and so on. And, and companies are all across the board are, are making such announcements for the next year plus. And, uh, and if all that's true, I, you know, I, I, th- I think that indeed the nature of the restructuring of the economy, and I, I think it'll have both industry dimensions, but also, as I talked about, uh, I, I think spatial dimensions. I mean, you know, one, one issue is in the, in the major cities in the world that, the, you know, the, in New York City, we'll see how, the, you know, the, what, what ends up there. They have this massive public transportation system, which in many ways works very well. But do you, do you need such a massive public transportation system if, if indeed Manhattan does, is, is no longer Manhattan and quite in the same way? Uh, in the future. Ken, do I know uh, what this is? I think somebody, some people push back on this argument, right? They say, uh, you know, as soon as people start coming back, there's going to be a a big, uh, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. And so, so, so indeed you're going to, you know, people are going to want to go to the office because it, because, because they they see that they, or at least perceive they can't uh, advance and, uh, and, and be productive without that. But, but I don't know. I think actually, (laughs) Uh, uh, again, businesses are figuring out, uh, again, we can do a remarkable amount remotely. And, and so I, I don't think we'll go back to February, February 2020 level of activity. Very interesting to get your perspective on that. And I think you're a pretty good online <laughs> lecturer amongst the best. So your students have been very lucky uh, to have you. Uh, Frederick, some, some final comments and questions from you. Yes, I would like to continue the discussion on productivity because as... as uh, as John says, it's of course absolutely crucial for uh, for wages and uh, for well for living standards, welfare, tax revenues, everything. And it's therefore very worrying that it's declining. And it's a mystery. I mean, we have had this sharp acceleration in uh, automat- automation, uh, the digitalization. We would have expected that to kick in and, and be seen in the in the productivity figures. So. Here is a, a speculation or a hypothesis that you might want to comment on. Could it be that it doesn't kick in because of the structural shift where the service sector today is so big and that there might be differences in productivity growth in services manufacturing? I mean, globally, I think two-thirds of the global economy now is in services. I mean, it's a tremendous increase for how it was a few decades ago. And we know that we have parts of the service industry where it's difficult to have productivity improvements. I mean, the, I think the typical example is a symphony orchestra. Of course, you can play Beethoven twice the pace, but it's not really the same, right? Uh, and then you have other parts of service industry where you could have productivity improvements, but it's so regulated. And we see that you know, services are much more regulated than, than in, in goods, and not least in international trade. So that's a, a, a kind of question to you. Could this be part of the explanation, and what should we do about it? Well, so, so that's a, like a like a question one, the key key question or core question, and and you know, you know what what are the uh, these other factors? And I think the kind of structural change you're talking about probably pl- uh, probably is playing uh, an, an important role. But let me 
Let me come back again to the surge in productivity in the high tech sectors in the late 1990s and early 2000s, and then the, and the decline. And, and so even, with, even within those industries, even in the, I'll call it the non-manufacturing high tech industries, you saw when it, if you just focus on those industries alone within the industries, not, not the structural change you're talking about, which, I, which I'm very sympathetic with, you saw an enormous surge in productivity uh, in software publishers and in uh, uh, information portals and uh, computer system design and um, you know, all the sectors that are sitting in, in the next industries, the information sector and the, uh, in, 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 in the, uh, the, the sort of the a uh, high-tech part of the service sector. You saw enormous surges in productivity, just, just phenomenal, double-digit levels of productivity growth in those, within those sectors, and then, and then that's all slowed down. So, so I, I think there's been enormous within-sector uh, productivity decline, and, and I don't think that that's easy to, I don't think that that's easy to account for by the kind of structural um, uh, sectoral shifts um, uh, argument that you're making, which I'm also, I think is part, is again part of the story, but I don't think it's the whole story. Thanks very much. Uh, any final concluding questions or comments from Johan or Frederick, or from you indeed, John? No, I think I'm fine, and no, I think I really enjoyed I... listening to all of this. Me too. Uh, yeah. Me too. Final remarks from you, John Halterwang, it's been a pleasure having you here. No. No, it's been great. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sorry to say, I'm, I'm enormously honored, and but also very pleased the the organizers uh, managed to pull this off. When you know, I actually did learn about this early, uh, before pre-pandemic, and we were all looking forward to, it, and I'm indeed already making plans for my trip to Stockholm last last May. And and like lots of us, I'll just say, early in the pandemic, you know, just how naive we all were, in you know, late late March and, and early April, we were like, oh well. Maybe by May we'll be back open. <laughs> so, so I'm 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 sorry I'm not there, but I'm delighted that we've been able to to, to manage this. It's it's uh, kind of say great to see uh, all of you virtually and to be able to participate in this way. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and hopefully there'll be a chance to uh, meet again physically in the not too distant future. But perhaps let's not make any firm predictions about those dates just yet. <laughs> yeah. So thank you yeah. very much yeah. to our winner, John Haltewanger. Thank you also very much to Frederick, Yuan, and everybody here in Stockholm. And thanks to all of you for watching from your offices, gardens, wherever you are. Um, so yes, hope to see you again in person soon. Bye bye for now. <laughs>